hello remote community and hello to everyone who is new in this group and who is joining us for the first open sessions of the remote talks and remote seats live stream through the remote channel on youtube welcome to remote latin america online travel show we are a community of travel leaders that brings together the most creative hoteliers and local experts in latin america with the most innovative travel designers from all over the world who have interest and passion for Latin America. For the past four years, we have promoted immersive events to be together in some of the remotest places in Latin America. And this is our first 100% online travel show. We know how busy our virtual lives has been in the, seven, uh, in the past seven months. And we appreciate your taking your time to connect with the remote community. Thank you very much for being here and for supporting our initiatives. It's not been easy for anyone in our industry. We are very sorry for so many lives lost and for business that had to finish their operations. We have no words to express how sad we are about it. But life goes on. We must go ahead to be alive, to maintain our business up, to keep on traveling and promoting this industry we love, and to fight together to have tourists back strong again. About our show, as some of you know, last March, we were exactly in Cafayati, where we were supposed to be in right now, on our second site inspection, when the pandemic announcement was made. We were preparing the final details for our immersive offline events and had to abruptly fly back home to, be, uh, to avoid being stuck in Argentina. And it took a while until we realized it would not be possible to keep a Cafayari meeting in 2020. Our signature immersion represents a lot to us. It's the time of the year when we have the chance to co-live with many members of the community with quality time, exploring your remote destination and its peculiarities, and making personal and business connections that are enabled by these pillars. Postponing the show to 2021 was probably the most difficult and painful decision we had since remote was created but for sure the best one we could have, as time showed. But as we are very used to creating and building our events from zero, we started working hard to adapt ourselves to this completely new situation. And in this reinvented process, since the pandemic and its restrictions were announced, some of our team members, including myself, got very frustrated and in some occasions, couldn't see the path we should follow. But gratefully, we are a team of tireless people and this frustration gave place to reset our beliefs and dreams and the opportunity to see this situation as a big challenge that we were strong enough to face. We are a resilient team and we felt we could support and be supported by our community. And here we are. Actually, we feel very fortunate for having started last year the shift to be more than a series of great immersive events. We find out in 2019 that we should become a more uh, a perennial platform for our community throughout the year and started this move to be remote not only geographically, but also in the digital aspect. Remote is part of our DNA. And we hope this online travel show can strengthen our connection in this new time when everybody is working remotely wherever we are. But the best person to talk more about this new moment in remote Latin America short history is my business partner, Clara, who has led this process. So Clara, could you share a little bit about it with our community and audience? Yes, definitely. First of all, thank you so much for joining us today. Wow, I see more than 150 people connected right now. That's awesome. Thank you. Well, 
Although we planned so hard to be in Cafayate today, and I wish we were there at this exact moment, this online event has given us many new opportunities, like sharing this moment with a larger group of friends, partners, co-workers, all of the travel industry. Around one year ago, exactly on October 24th, many of you were, in, were with us in, Col in Colombia for our first day of the remote Barichara. Endings always come with new beginnings. As we ended the 2019 edition, we, uh, we were also announcing the beginning of a new phase. After a long rebranding process, we made a commitment to promote Latin America, not only for four days anymore, but all year round. For 2020, we promised to break the barriers of the usual four-day immersion event to form a community in which we can really fulfill our mission of creating stronger and lasting connections. We had a whole new strategy planned out to keep this community together during 2020. Now it feels like we were getting prepared for these crazy times, but it wasn't so simple like that. Just like everybody else, the pandemic hit us right on. In 2020, we saw the whole world becoming remote in a very challenging circumstance. On the other hand, it has been an important learning process and a good opportunity to dive deep into these community plans we started back in 2019. We are glad we are safe, we are healthy, to be able to focus on that and fasten this process on the last few months. The result of that, a brand new website and intranet for our community, 30 online encounters in the last six months, in a community project ongoing. And we are very happy to host our first online travel show and have its opening day live stream here on YouTube. Besides this round of remote talks and seats that are part of today's schedule, we'll have 114 leaders joining us on the following days of this week. Until Friday, we're hosting eight hours of one-on-one -on -one business appointments. That means a total of 2,736 meetings in four days. Wow, I hope the remoters are ready for this marathon. Hey, Lisa, what did you say? I think everybody's eager to get back on track, am I right? What a pleasure to have you join us for this event. When this pandemic started, we moved conversations from how to get to Cafayate to how to get through the week, right? In the past months, we have had several conversations with the members of our community, travel designers, hotels, DMCs, to understand how they were dealing with their business and personal issues while having to adapt to this new scenario. I want to thank all travel designers with whom I'm mostly in touch throughout the year who have invested their time and effort to participate in our latest training sessions, our online encounters like this one, and to co-create this amazing week ahead of us. As Clara just said, structuring our community was already our plan, and we are developing a new project to strengthen the ties to the travel community. We feel there is a natural bond between our team, our member properties and DMCs, and our partner travel designers, especially through the values and interests we share. We are now working on creating intentional points of content, consistent and relevant content for you, the rituals, the frequency our community wants to be in touch. Basically, we are working on the how, because why we need to be in touch is already very clear to us. But going back to this event, when we decided last April to create a virtual event in October, we didn't know how the day-to-day -day life would be, if people would still be at home or in their offices, if virtual would still be a thing. But I finally see it is a good moment to be hosting an online show and hope and happy to have this first day of the event open to the whole community and friends who wish to be inspired by our presenters. From tomorrow on, we have a great team of 57 travel designers 
from 15 countries excited to learn more about the current situation in each, each destination, to be in touch with long-term friends and make new connections. And what about the exhibitors, Marcelo? How ready are they? Well, Lydia, look, from the exhibitor side of the event, people with whom I have been in contact more often than ever since March, with countless emails and calls, as you know, we also have 57 companies eager to connect with these amazing travel designers you have invited. Our team of 57 exhibitors from 11 countries in Latin America is made up of the most creative, unique, small scales and remote hotels, boats and local experts from the very south of Patagonia to Baja California in the north of Mexico. We are actually quite surprised and grateful to have this number of attendees in this first online edition of our travel show. Uh, even during these tough times, we have welcomed five new members in our community. It, it shows the importance of being and, and feeling part of a community, a community of professionals who faces the same challenges, who can inspire and be inspired by others and teach and learn from others. It's the sense of the motto, we are stronger together. All of this gives us a lot of confidence and hope that things will get back on track soon in our industry. And if you were here on a stage, I would ask for a big round of applause to all the beloved members of our remote community. As you are not, I won't take any longer here, as I imagine that you are as anxious as me for the beginning of our talks today. So I invite our content manager, Daniel Nunes, to finally present the speakers of the day. Danny, it's your turn now. Thank you, Marcelo. Hello, everybody. It's a big pleasure to start another edition of Remote Talks. This moment during our travel shows, when we stop to watch these special guests encouraging us to rethink the way we work and live. Today, we are going to have also the remote seats when members of our own community of travel leaders share their ideas in short talks and panels. So this is our schedule for the day. We are going to be here together for around two hours and a half with six great speakers presenting their short talks. We are going to have time for questions after the sessions. So please feel free to send your comments to the chat, okay? So this year we have two main subjects to discuss about. The first one is challenges of isolation, which all of us had to face somehow recently. And to start the first part of our show, we are very proud to have here with us today, Suniva Sorby. Suniva is from Norway, and we've met her a few years ago, once she was the director for, of sales for Polar Latitudes, an expedition cruise company that explores Antarctica and the Arctic. Then we've got this message some time ago, saying that she was departing to the Arctic to engage on a project called Hearts in the Ice. Together with her expedition partner, Hilde Falunström, Suniva spent one year at a remote trapper's cabin called Banzebu, with no running water and electricity. So this story is so amazing that we invited Suniva to come and share it with us. Self-isolation in the Arctic, shining a light on climate change. I would like to invite you to watch a short video about it and then to welcome our dear Suniva Sorby. Imagine leaving your family, friends, and the comforts of home for a trip to the top of the world, where civilization is almost 100 miles away and everything you need to survive has to fit in a 215 square foot space. Two women did that in the name of science. And right now we are in Bamsebu, a small trapper's cabin built 90 years ago. This tiny remote cabin is home to citizen scientists Hilde Fulanstrom and Sinova Sorby. It has no electricity or running water. Come on in. This is this is both uh, our workout studio, our <laughs> office, our deluxe office space, uh, my bedroom, uh, dining room, and a living room. It's all in one. 
these two containers have um, ice and snow in there. And when it melts, we just, that's how we get our fresh water. The two co-founded Hearts in the Ice to foster a global conversation about climate change. We had two main goals to be up here. One was to collect data for a group of international scientists studying climate change, and also to connect with school kids around the world. Among the projects is one for NASA on clouds that could impact the Earth's temperature, and another one involves collecting saltwater samples. And we have also collecting sea ice samples. So we drill a hole through the ice and underneath the sea ice there are microorganisms that the scientists believe is extremely important for the whole ecosystem in the ocean. Today is March 9th and it's the first time that I see the sun since October. Doing all that data collection was made more difficult by three months of darkness and a harsh winter. It was an unbelievably difficult, cold, dark winter. It was uh, all the way down to 34 minus and the wind chill 45 minus. We had hurricanes, several hurricanes, and the whole hut was shivering. And you're wondering if it's strong enough to actually withstand the hurricane winds. But they believe their efforts are well worth it. We can't wait any longer. We've seen with COVID that the change is happening fast, that the planet is taking an absolute breather because of all of us, and we're all needed right now. Hi, everybody. Um, wow, I am, can you see my screen okay? Can you see my screen okay? so far yeah um okay good so um wow talk about remote um i have been way up north for a year and like all of you um i've had to go through some changes too a uh, three three months of our stay up there was absolutely unplanned so i i have been in the polar regions for over 20 years on and off in my life like I'm sure you can imagine what it's like. Your career takes one path and then you go off and you come back on. And the polar regions have always been my sort of guiding path. And I remember this first trip that I was on in the Antarctic and there was a man in a Zodiac with me. I was the Zodiac driver and he, we're in Paradise Bay. And for those of you who have been to the Antarctic, the name says it all, Paradise Bay. And he, he says to me, what are we supposed to see here? And I thought, did, did he really ask me that just now? And it, you know, I, I, I sought this man out. I found him on the back deck and I realized that he was uh, there by himself. Uh, he was supposed to go with his wife who had actually recently died of lung cancer. And he was traveling with all this guilt and, and angst and weight with him. And so it, it, it really struck a chord with me and it made me realize that sometimes it doesn't even matter um, where you go. Um, what matters is what we take with us when we go there. And I share that as a starting point because, you know, we're all living in a world right now which is completely upside down. Um, and all of us are being forced to rethink how we live, how we lead, how we travel, and what we actually really need. There's a beautiful quote by Marcel Proux. Uh, perhaps the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And I think that's something that all of us um, right now are actually being forced to do is look at everything differently. So when I went to um, Bumsabu, and Bumsabu is a name given to the hut that we were staying in, we are, we are 140 kilometers away from the nearest neighbor. If you look at this map, the North Pole and the northern tip of um, Norway, we are right between the North Pole and the northern tip of Norway. We are, that's our little trapper's cabin right there. And what you see are our reindeer, which oddly enough are social distancing. Who knew Who knew that was the thing with the wildlife out there? Um, we were so far away from anything like Netflix, shopping, TV, distraction, anything that would have any resemblance of my world back home. And I have to tell you, in this place of isolation, you go so far deep inside yourself and you start to ask yourself, um, 
you know, what do you, what do you, what matters to you? Of, of uh, what's your purpose? And that is something that both Hill and I were very, very aligned with in this trapper's cabin. You can see there are two solar panels. So I'll take you outside our world and then I'll take you inside my world a little bit and then we'll have some questions after. But we we are, this is an old trapper's cabin built in 1930 for beluga hunting and they decimated the population of beluga there. But thank, thankfully for us, we saw a resurgence of beluga in the bay in the fjord to the right here while we were staying at Bumsabu. Uh, we had no running water, no electricity. We were living, you know, the way the trappers did back then. And according to one of the historians, it was harder for us to go from our socialized world to I'm this sorry. world because we're living in a world with so much stimulus and so much pressure and so much stress. And Can we you hear. Can you hear me? So I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, we are, you are not sharing. Your, your screen, we cannot see. Oh, you can't see my screen. Yeah, could you please share it? I'm sorry for that. Oh, <laughs> huh. Can you share it? Can you see it now? Okay. Yes, now okay. you see. Okay, so please, if you could start. Can again. you see it now? Yes, now we can see. Okay. Please go All ahead. Right. Um, so this is our little Bumsabu trapper's cabin with our reindeer neighbors. Um, this is the actual cabin itself. We, you know, to, to live in a world cut off from all sorts of um, all sorts of comforts of home is not for the faint of heart, but I have had a lot of experience. I was part of the first team of women to ski to the South Pole um, in 1992-93. And I've wanted to live that beautiful quote by Thoreau, which goes like this. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately and front only the essentials of life and not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I find that that line to be absolutely powerful. But for me, what it speaks to is, is what we're all going through right now is redefining what really matters. And we, in the year that we were there, we discovered what really matters. We had you know, wood for heating, we had, you know, ice for water, we had all of the food that was brought in that we needed for the entire nine months, which turned into 12 months because of COVID. We had communication in a box. This was a satellite from um, Tails Mission Link, and this was our connection to the outside world. We connected with 5,000 school kids from around the world to engage them in community around what was happening uh, with our climate and why we should care. Uh, we collaborated, and this is a real key for us, is the collaboration. This was not a project that was about Cineva or Hilda. It was really a project about crisis. You know, we are, I think that the climate crisis and COVID crisis absolutely go hand in hand. I mean, our entire world is interconnected from the ocean, the sky, everything on land in one small way or another. And we're being forced to really look at that very closely now. And we, we, so our intention was to share stories around the ice core, around phytoplankton, around the aurora, around the sky, the clouds, around the polar bears. We had 53 uh, polar bear encounters during our stay. And one of them, um, I have to tell you, was a little bit too close for comfort. It was actually two meters away from me as I went outside the door and it surprised me coming to the right around uh, around the corner. We do not go outside without a uh, flare gun or a rifle because you know we are so exposed. We travel by snowmobile, foot, kayak or boat. And you know, I like like many of you in the travel industry, my world has been travel. So how do you travel without going anywhere? Which is what we're being forced to ask ourselves right now. And I think it's so, I, I, I think purpose and our values are two, two main ingredients for how he and I were able to be successful in the year that we were up there. Our purpose, it was not about our ego. This was not about us, you know, fulfilling a personal dream of overwintering. This was really about using our experience to share with a much broader community why we're all connected, how we're all connected, and how important it is for every single one of us to lead ourselves in a time of change, to be that, that self, strong self-leader. But without purpose and without defining what we value in life, you know, we will be aimlessly off course. We were closer to the lowest band of the aurora, 
which is 120 kilometers above the horizon from where we were, we were closer to that than we were to the nearest town, which was 140 kilometers away. And I have to tell you, to be underneath the aurora and the northern lights, not looking north for it, but looking above, and it's completely showering over you, you feel reduced to the smallest version of yourself. In isolation, uh, we're allow, you know, we allow a, a deep opportunity for all of us to connect with nature and to connect with the essence of who we are. But we have to lose our mind to regain our senses, if you understand what I mean. So in our, in our darkness, um, in our complete disconnectedness, with the exception of the satellite device, we, you know, you take all my experience and you reduce it down to a, a, two women in the Arctic, simply to shine a light on how important and valuable each one of us are at this time, both with the COVID crisis and the climate crisis. We are all being asked to redefine our way of living and redefine what it actually means to live in purpose on purpose. And in darkness, there's light. I mean, we've heard that, we've heard that expression before, but adapt being adaptable is the absolute key. For those of you who've lived in small spaces for a little while, maybe on top of your, your partner, your spouse, your kids, our space, as you saw in that little video, was was this. It was a it was nothing but um, you know, absolute 20 square meters. This, what you're looking at on the left is my office, uh, my bedroom, the dining room, the living room, and our training studio. It was all in one. And we made it work, uh, respecting our differences and communication, problem solving, making sure that your, your body language and what you say at the end of the day to your person is out of love and respect. And thank heaven for our little Etra, who um, never sees to give us lots of uh, compassion and, and care. And they, they are saying now that our pets are getting uh, maybe bald on the head because we're actually giving them so much love because they've never been with, with uh, their owners 24 seven like they have at this time. Um, but she was an absolute love. The darkness for me, three months of that was, was absolutely challenging. There is no outside ambient light. You, and you start, start to open parts of yourself that you've actually never seen before. And I wonder if some of you out there can relate to me on this very topic. It's, you know, when we're used to moving and used to doing and used to showing up with our job title or our being defined by, by, by the outside of who we are. And that's not there anymore. We can't interact with people. We can't hug. We can't build community in the way that we're used to. So who are we when that happens? We go deep inside. And in, in that space is... I mean, the Chinese symbol for, for crisis is danger and opportunity. I think there's tremendous opportunity for all of us to sort of learn from what he and I experienced up there. And that is that our fear, you know, is not that we're inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we're, we're so powerful. Uh, I'll share a quote by Viktor Frankl, who was um, a survivor of Auschwitz. And he said, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. And here is a man who was, you know, away from, from family, away from everything in Auschwitz and managed to come out with, with integrity and dignity and self-respect. And so I, you know, this experience in the Arctic um, is not over for us. We had planned to go and leave in May. And like a lot of things, the whole world caved in on us. Uh, we went and stayed until September. And as I sit here and speak with all of you now, I'm I'm actually going to go to the airport um, in a few hours and go to Oslo and travel back to Svalbard. And Hilda and I are going back to, um, to Bumsabu to continue our work because we believe that climate change is not taking a vacation. And so neither are we. We have decided to continue um, our work. And so I just a shameless plug for all of you maybe to go on our website and the shop and our book will come out at the end of uh, November, um, beginning of, um, of December. So I will stop this right now. Um, mm -hmm. and, and come back um, and take some time for some questions here because 
I have a whole book of things I could share with all of you, but I would like to make my time here relevant for all of you that uh, are in an industry that has been my my lifeblood for what feels like my entire being. My father was a captain on an oil tanker. And when I was um, in my teens, he was gone all the time. And so the call of the sea, the call of you know culture and bridging divides by, by travel is in all of our blood or we wouldn't all be on the phone call right now. So come at me with questions and there's no question that is too personal. Go. <laughs> and congratulations for such a beautiful work uh, so guys I invite all the audience to make their, their questions uh, while we wait for, for uh, some questions I have one here and Suniva uh, during all this time that you were there in the middle of nowhere what was the hardest moment you and you experienced in the Arctic I think the um, this is going to sound very strange because I'm on this Zoom or remote this call with you with on Streamyard. Our our um, our biggest challenge was uh, was communication, both between the two of us um, and also uh, with the rest of the world. Because you saw that little box I had, we were the first civilians to use um, what they call an MCD mission link built for the military and the maritime industry. And I have to tell you, you know, as we know, technology does not always work the way we want it to. And we have no, we can't call anybody to come and fix something for us. So we're so isolated and alone. Um, and, it, and it creates, it bred frustration and, and anxiety. And uh, we both have different ways of dealing with frustration and anxiety. So our body language became very, very important. And for those of you at home with, with your families are working from home, you know, communication for us became absolutely critical, like, and trying to time and do things together at the same time, shared, you know, shared purpose, training at the same time, um, wow. eating at the same time. Wow. Mm. <laughs> All right. I have a question here from Solicite Turismo. They are asking, how did your world, uh, at home change when you came back? Ooh, wow. You know, I when we left for Bumsabu, we thought we were, and I'm, I'm not going to brag saying this, we thought, wow, we're doing something really on the edge here we're, by going into isolation, doing our citizen science work, connecting with kids. And then all of a sudden in March, um, we learn of a world that's now being thrown into isolation. And we were sought out by all sorts of, you know, um, uh, I, I want to say hypey, but sort of sensationalist media that wanted to call us COVID castaways. And we said, no, we are, we are not, we are not engaging in that dialogue. We chose to be here. So choosing to do this and then coming back to the world that all of you are in now, that I'm in now temporarily was very disruptive and unsettling. And it's it's almost like I feel the heaviness of everybody. We feel like people have lost their sense of humor, you know? Um, so it's a, it's a really real thing. I mean, the pandemic is, people are tired uh, and I'm feeling it. So I would just encourage, you know, be mindful of our wellness. And it's not just eating right and getting uh, like training physically, which we did quite a bit of there. It's really understanding that having a sense of purpose and being aligned with your values are what we all need to really look at deeply here. So um, yeah, uh, Solicity, I hope I answered your question. It's sort of, it's just came back to a changed world and I'm not sure what to make of it yet. All right. Uh, we have another question. Damaris Ribeiro is asking, did you feel affected psychologically during the period of dense darkness? And how was it to leave the hut and not be clear at any time of the day? <laughs> that is a great question. Um, I think that was the biggest challenge for me psychologically because my I am used to seeing the world with my eyes. And now I had to see the world with simply my senses and a headlamp. And everything that were, our world was reduced to the world that was that was viewed through the through the light of the headlamp. Um, I, 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 I had fear. I discovered fear emerge in me that I've never actually, you know, had to meet. And that fear was uh, coupled with anxiety sometimes. And it was just a matter of self-talk and reminding myself that 
there, you know, there is nothing really to fear here except the polar bear. Um, and we had a rifle and we were armed, um, but it does play with your mind. It can actually really mess you up a little bit psychologically. So we, um, we travel very close to Bumsabu in the darkness because of our, um, our exposure to the polar bears. And that was very, that was actually very difficult not to go far. All right. And we have a, a, a question here from our colleagues from Rainforest Expeditions. Surrounded mm -hmm. by such an amazing landscape, what was the happiest moment you, you, you will never forget? Mm. Wow, great question. I have to say, because when you ask that, the thing that comes screaming forward is um, it was in April. And we are doing work with, you know, six different uh, researchers around the world. And one of them was to, to um, do, you know, polar bear sightings. How, what polar bears are we seeing? What's their behavior? Roughly, what's the size of their footprint? And we are now in April and we discover that there's a polar bear possibly near one of the glaciers. So we both take our snowmobiles and we drive over to the glacier and we sit still and we just watch and we wait. And now all of a sudden comes the polar bear mom, and then all of a sudden appears a four month old little polar bear cub. And I have to tell you of all the moments um, out there at, at like in the last year, it was bearing witness to the most beautiful exchange between a mother and her cub. It was so tender and um, it, it, it's just, you know, to have moments like that, to be, to be the absolute observer, uh, you know, was, was what a privilege. Wow. So we have another one from Corinne Tateosian. Hello, Corinne. <laughs> so she's asking, could you share with us some relevant information you could collect during your stay that has to do with the global warming? Absolutely, great question. Um, so I will. I, can, I have lots to share, but we're we're redoing our website right now to put some of our findings on there. It should be done by the end of um, October, early November. But very quickly, there are two two key things I want to share right now. One is phytoplankton. It's something that we cannot see unless you put it under a microscope. We collected phytoplankton, 21 samples throughout the time, uh, for Scripps Institute of Oceanography for Fjord Phyto uh, in San Diego. And what's, what's very important there is phytoplankton thrive in freshwater. They produce more oxygen in our atmosphere than a rainforest. We absolutely need phytoplankton. And they are discovering, uh, trying to understand what happens when all the ice is, the glaciers melting and pouring fresh water into, into the ocean, which is salt water. Phytoplankton disperse and they breed in salt water. So um, there's a big question as to whether or not phytoplankton, um, bre uh, the breeding of phytoplankton will be disrupted if there's more fresh water being poured in. Um, so that's something that we're adding value to. The second has to do with the ice. Uh, we know that change has been happening uh, for decades around the climate. And I think the main distinction right now is to separate natural change versus what's created by us humans. And so one of those things has to do with the ice distribution. Um, and there is, in fact, a real correlation between the fact that Svalbard, where we have been, is seeing less sea ice than ever before. And what, why this matters for lots of different things, uh, especially for the polar bears. We discovered a polar bear hunting a reindeer. Polar bear eats seals. Uh, seals are full of fat and the polar bears needs a lot, need a lot of fat. And they hunt reindeer now. Um, no, I don't say they hunt reindeer now at, instead of seal, but we have discovered them hunting reindeer. And this has been experienced over the last few years. And we saw this firsthand. And this is because no seals on ice, polar bears have to eat. So this is a real way that uh, adaptability has been showing up as a, as a real result of a changing climate. A very disturbing too. Fantastic. Mm. And Suniva, Cecile Adam is asking, what were, what were you not prepared for and you wish you would have? More music. <laughs> I mean, you know, one thing that Hilda and I learned uh, was that we have to celebrate, you know, every night we lit a candle and made dinner and sat down and, and we just shared our, you know, 
and not in a forced way or sort of a corny way. It was just very authentic, just our gratitude for a healthy body, a healthy mind and an opportunity to to be doing what we're doing. Um, but I have to tell you, one one way I like to celebrate is is music. And uh, I so if any one of you have playlists on Spotify, you want to send me in the next few weeks, I will take them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, guys, so just send your, your songs to, to Suniv, okay? <laughs> That'd be great. I need some Latin music. <laughs> great. Fantastic. Suniv, um, we, are, we have another question here. What, what are you thinking about the COVID and the climate change now? This is our last question. Um, I, I, you know, I said this earlier, I really feel like the, the climate crisis and the COVID crisis are sort of walking hand in hand in a very surreal, odd way. Our entire world seems to be put on pause in a way that we've known it. We have been put on pause. And I feel very strongly that there, if there was ever a time for all of us to rethink how we're living, it's now. And it's a time to rethink how we are leading. You know, we need to la lead not with authority, but we need to lead with, with compassion and collaboration. And I, I, I feel uh, right now, we are being, all of us are being forced to actually dig a little deep inside our soul and our hearts and our minds to live uh, more on purpose. Uh, and make sure that our resources, if we are those of the privileged few, that our resources are shared because those people, there are many people that have been displaced by COVID and displaced by the climate. And if they are not, um, you know, their primary needs are not met, they will not be able to give, you know, they will not be able to actually um, enter into the conversation. Uh, so we need to take care of each other. We need to understand that this is this is a collective issue that and that we all have a purpose to play in it right now. And that is a very um, internal sort of journey that we all have to walk. But I would encourage every I'm sorry I'm speaking about it like this, but I'm not sorry. But I just I just feel like this is an incredible opportunity for all of us to turn this into something that serves humankind collectively. Fantastic. Hmm. Oh, Suniva, what a pleasure. Uh, it was great to be with you. Uh, you. Uh, we, wish we, we wish we could have much more time to be here, but I know we have to go to the airport as well. And to our audience, there are many ways to follow Suniva as she showed uh, us uh, a few minutes ago. So Suniva, any, any, any uh, final message before um, we finish? Well, I just want to say thank you. It's been a pleasure, um, you, you know, connecting with you, Daniel and Marcelo. And, um, you know, we're going to continue our work out there. And just for all of you that ever have moments of feeling very alone or dark or in despair, because it's a very real thing right now, I want you to send send your energy and your thoughts north and just know that we'll be sending it right back to all of you from up there because we have the the Northern Lights and all that magnetism to like give us all a great embrace. And thank you very much. I wish I could see all of your faces. Um, I, I'm, I'm honored to be on the call. Thank you. Thank Danielle. you, Suniva. Yeah. Thank you for inspiring us. Mm -hmm. Good luck in your next challenge. We are going to be here following your next steps and trying to do our part as well to fight, I guess. And don't with... forget to pre-order the book. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 you did thank good. Yeah, thank Great. you so much, Suniva. Thank Have you, and good day. luck. Bye bye. Thank you so much. So now it's time to start our presentations for the remote seats. It was great to be here with Suniva. So for those who who are new in in our community, this is the time when voices from our group of travel leaders try to spread ideas, seeds, and experiences in short talks. Once again, the theme for the next talks is challenges of isolation. And our first speaker of the remote seats is Francesco Gali Zugaru. He's the CEO for Aqua Expeditions from Peru, a pioneer as the first luxury small ship river cruise operator in South America 13 years ago. Francesco has also experienced a big challenge in the past year to make a big project come true to talk about the epic journey of launching an expedition ship under the pandemic, I would like to invite Francisco Gali Zucaro. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, 
Good afternoon, everybody. From wherever you're joining us, I'm joining you from Singapore. So it's uh, 11.45 p.m., but I've had plenty of coffees as a true Italian and, and happy to join you tonight. Thanks, Daniel. Um, what an inspiring talk. And uh, just as a transition, obviously, my talk today is going to be focusing on our parts of the world and where I'm passionate about and quite a few degrees warmer. So come up a few degrees, a few um, uh, you know, latitudes and then longitudes and come up all the way up to the Peruvian Amazon. So I'm going to share a little bit of the story of what I've been up to for the last, um, you know, 12 months or so. Um, and if you can, I believe, see my screen right now, I'm just going to share some inspiring images of what really um, leads me to do what I love. And, and I think you should be seeing it now. So as you may may or may not know, our company was founded 13 years ago with my love for South American exploration. I cut my teeth into tourism in, in the Galapagos Islands, but really my true passion came when I started Aqua Expeditions in the Peruvian Amazon. And since then, we've grown the business. I moved to Asia because I fell in love with growing the business in Southeast Asia. We launched our Mekong Cruiser. But a few years ago, we decided to grow our business in Peru, and, and I made it the decision, whilst bold and innovative, is still uh, ambitious to build our new river cruiser for the Peruvian Amazon in Vietnam. The reason I did this was that it obviously made sense to me. Excuse me one second. I think you've got here. Um, what is it? The, can you see my, my, my slides? I think so. You should be able to see it. Uh, one second. Um, one second, always here. You should be able to see it here. And uh, sorry for that, just technicalities always come up when you don't want them to. And that should do it, hopefully. Yes. So the inspiration behind it is obviously a design inspiration. The ships that we build are built on inspiration of design that obviously stems from South America. It stems from the Peruvian Andes. It stems from modern contemporary design and the colors and the influence of, Peru, of, uh, of uh, Portuguese azulejos and the towels and the influence of the rubber boom era. But all this comes into a design process that comes about a year before actual building. Once all those designs are put in place and the actual technical drawings are put in place, then comes the building the phase. The building phase today was done in Ho Chi Minh. It started about 12 months ago. And whilst I was there for the launching, come February, when lockdown happened, lockdowns happened, I had to revert back to Singapore. I was actually on the last flight out of Lima, where I was on the Amazon. And I came back to Singapore, and since then, obviously, into what Singapore called the circuit breaker. However, during that period, I had to remotely empower a team of incredible, talented individuals over the years that we've that we put together to build Aquaneta in Ho Chi Minh. Now, this, as you know, these river cruisers are five foot. They have a five foot draft. They can only navigate in fresh waters of uh, fresh bodies of water and have to be heavy lifted in order to transport somewhere else to operate in South America. So this posed an incredible challenge for me during the last 12 months to monitor and oversee a project that from February I had not seen. And this was the last day I was on board, uh, which was in the steel structure. And as you can imagine, these ships are mostly about the interior design aspect, about the attention to details. The steel work is relatively fast. Building that hull and everything to that point took about three to four months. The rest of the six to eight months is all about the interior design. So my last, that was my last day in the yard. Come circuit breaker in Singapore, everything goes remote, everything goes digital. And I had to create a way in order for these renderings, which are, you know, the opposite images, the far upper right hand corner and the bottom left hand corner are renderings of that concept that I had. And then the reality, which is top left and bottom right. And hopefully you can see that, you know, what we designed two years ago, we were actually able to deliver on. But to do this all remotely, to inspire a team of professionals in Ho Chi Minh with language barriers, with video Zoom calls, Vietnam luckily went into a lockdown that lasted only two weeks. Now, because we decided to build with a military yard and then bring in contractors from around the world, the, the yard, what they did is during the circuit breaker is during their lockdown, they brought in all our contractors into the yard 
closed down the yard for two weeks, as you would assume Vietnam was rightly built to do, and then allowed us to continue building through those two weeks, then opened up the rest of Vietnam and continued until we took delivery. However, all this has to be done, not only with the limitations of travel, of travel bans that I was never able to go, but neither were our contractors from abroad. We had to ship everything in and then train locals to obviously do a lot of the interior design work as, as far as the buildup. So incredible challenges to make it come to life, as you can see in these renderings. I mean, really, you could almost not differentiate between what's a rendering and what not. These are not professionals. These are all taken on my team's iPhones because we haven't even been able to send our professional photographers to see the final product. But look at the tiles here. These are custom-made tiles made in, Viet in, in Thailand by artisans that wanted to replicate that feeling of those Portuguese tiles that had an influence in the rubber boom era of, of uh, Iviquitos. Again, lobby spaces. Here we had to bring in lighting experts from Italy, but they had to ship the equipment in and then their local contractors had built it up. We had acoustic specialists in the dining room. But again, to evoke this feeling of this black water tributary that I wanted this modern contemporary design, and then obviously to deliver a world-class vessel on the opposite side of the world. And the challenge for me is, okay, how do I get this ship from Ho Chi Minh all the way to South America. Well, the only way to do it was heavy lifter on a massive cargo ship. This was the first time it's ever been done. Uh, what comes to mind is maybe a modern day Fitzcarraldo. Um, really, I wanted to push the envelope, but I need to empower my team. I find a group of individuals who are as passionate and as perseverant as I was to make sure their attention to detail was as spot on as mine and my wife's are with regards to details. And so numerous hundreds of video calls throughout tours at night, during the day with lighting, everything in order to come together these bring these details of hanging the paintings at the right height, getting the right frames of these uh, original antique prints from the Amazon of palm trees, getting the right wood veneers and that architectural feet of a spiral staircase. All this is, is got to be done remotely. I was sitting in Singapore, luckily, luckily I had one country which I did have the same time zone, which was Vietnam. Had this been done in Peru, obviously we've got 13 time zone differences. So something was at least lined up to make my life somewhat easier. But then comes the biggest challenge, which is once we took delivery of the ship, which was actually only two weeks delayed, and rest assured that if there's one time in my life that I had hoped that something would be delayed would be this bill, because obviously there wasn't no huge imminent rush to get back to South America, given the travel restrictions. But notwithstanding all that, I had booked this massive cargo ship called the Svenja out of a company out of Germany to pick her up and transport her all the way to South America. And that can only be done. Every day of delay was a $20,000 ticket. So I couldn't be one day late. Luckily, I asked them to slow down on the pedal and they were coming from Korea and they picked her up two weeks later, which was that God thankful two week delay that they gave me. But then came a three day lifting job. I hired drones. I sent out four or five drones, photographers, videographers to monitor remotely how she was being lifted. She's a 700 ton ship being lifted onto a heavy cargo ship and then navigated basically 11,000 nautical miles from Ho Chi Minh all the way through. She just arrived yesterday into Durban, South Africa to refuel and then all the way to Belen. So yes, she's heading your way to Brazil, but just for a quick stop as she continues on to Iquitos for the 2000 nautical mile journey up the, up the Amazon, basically crossing all of South America. So she has to do this on the back of a heavy transport ship. And I was able to luckily see her the other day as she stopped in Singapore for a quick refueling. And then um, obviously, um, jump on board and see her for the first time. This picture right here and a video that's gonna ensue in a few seconds is gonna start a video of showcasing how she was being lifted. But to be able to see uh, the fruition of incredible hard work over the last few years to a design concept, to bring her to reality, to launch her in Vietnam and to, to heavy lift her onto this ship, was an incredible opportunity to see her last week in Singapore. She arrives in Belen and then takes 1100 11, mile journey up to Iquitos where she'll arrive end of November. So on that note, I'd like to ask our technical crew to uh, cue in the video, which is a slow moving video of the journey of um, the Aqua um, Nera, as she's due to be called, into Brazil, but she'll arrive on the 17th of October 
and then make her voyage all the way up to Iquitos. So it's been an incredible journey. I think this is the type of passion that perseveres during these difficult times and allows us to look forward to something grandiose, putting the last difficult months behind us and hopefully having that window of uh, aspiration to something great, which is what we all strive for to get our teams and our guests back on board. So I look forward to seeing her in Iquitos when she arrives and I am uh, excited about those days when I'm able to embark her. Um, as you can see here, she's being lifted onto the Svenja and it's been an incredible uh, journey to see her. She is 700 tons, really, really, truly spectacular to see. She looks like a toy here, you can see. It, it really is something that I'll only be able to witness once in my life. I missed that opportunity to see her firsthand, but I have to say that it's kept me excited about the industry, about the perseverance and resilience that I have as a team, and also the support that our entire industry has shown to making sure that she is welcome when she arrives with incredible um, you know, demand when she is due to restart come the end of the year, whenever uh, that is, hopefully sooner rather than later. But it's been an incredible way to witness something. My, this is my fifth ship over the last 13 years. And anyways, it's a confirmation that we've built an incredible team and that this is no, by no means a solo effort, that this is a team of professional individuals that uh, are here because they love what they do, just like all of you. And this is my passion. I don't see myself doing anything else. So hopefully you've enjoyed this little anecdotes of what we've been up to, but we've definitely been keeping busy. Also, thank you everybody. And I wish you all a great rest of the show. Thank you so much, Francesco. I know it's late even in there in Singapore, but we have a few minutes just to ask you some questions here. Um, gladly, gladly. The first one, uh, I'm going to repeat the question that, that I, I asked to Suniva. What was the toughest moment for you during all this process as a leader? I think it, coming to terms with the fact that I wasn't able to go. Um, I think accepting and kind of surrendering, as they say, uh, surrendering to an, a team of, and empowering my team and letting them know early on that we were going to be here in spirit and with all the support systems that we can provide for the team on the ground in Ho Chi Minh. But accepting that and, and surrendering to that force that just doesn't allow us to. So us, Vietnam and Singapore have been very strict for numerous reasons, obviously. But um, the result is there. She's beautiful. She's impressive. I was able to witness her. And uh, I think it's a confirmation of an incredible teamwork. But, but was there any moment during uh, the process that you thought about? Yeah, I think the finger bi fingernail biting moment was the actual lifting. To see those first few seconds of those straps lifting 700. So basically, it took us about four months of the technical lift plan to figure out stability, logistics, weight distribution on board. I had to hire a company, about 15 individuals, to go into the ship and tie down everything because we don't know what the seat conditions were going to be as she transverses the world over to South America. She's had, now we get daily updates. I can track it online on satellite and I can track where the Svenja is. Um, but we didn't know. So to see her lift out of the water and then that to do that strange maneuvering over the decks and pivot onto position and then, and then tie her down. They actually welded her down to the steel plate of the top of the deck. And consider that underneath the Aquaneda on the main deck is a massive ferry, ship, ferry boat underneath her inside the hull. So these, it's incredible, these, arc, these, these feats of uh, modern day engineering, but uh, it still blows my mind. But, but did, at any time, did you think about giving up of, on bringing it in the middle of the pandemic or, or not? No, so obviously we've all been pushing the elbow, remaining hopeful. Um, there was a time where I had to confirm the transport of the company and I knew that if I was going to be late and I wasn't going to be able to deliver, yeah, I was going to pay this $20,000 a day delay fee. And, you know, you, you add the numbers up 30 days late and, you know, there goes our budget. So I had to those difficult days, but, um, you know, uh, I, I pursue, I'm, I'm very persistent, very, uh, very determined and, uh, and we came through it. Okay, uh, and Francesco, the, the cruise industry industry was very impacted by the pandemic, right? Uh, how how risky is it to launch a new ship under these circumstances? 
So definitely everybody's been hit, but particularly so I think some of the PR efforts of the larger mainstream cruise uh, industry has been affected. Luckily, I'd like to think that uh, we're in a niche of our own as far as small, all the small ships, we're 15 to 20 cabins. These are many of them are privately bought out. Uh, we can control the setting automatically. The ships are 60 square me 60 meters where we have a lot of built-in space as well already for our guests. So I think, and we're coastal waters. So I think a lot of concerns regarding mainstream cruising is that you're doing transoceanic voyages and you may get stuck in a foreign port. We are coastal cruising or river cruising because of our new Indonesia cruiser. And so we're never more than a hundred, few hundred meters from shore. So we can always disembark our guests. And I think that demand is there from our loyal guests. We've got a very strong book of business going forward and good visibility into future. But obviously travel bans needs to be lifted. So until that happens, we're staying strong. Okay. We have the last question here. Diana Moschini is asking, how did he how did you motivate and transfer your passion for the project to the local team in a remote way? Um, well, this, this has been a team that's been with me building the Aqua Mekong four years ago. So already uh, I lead by example. I'm the one that kind of just leads by, you know, jumping in there and rolling on my sleeve and getting into the yard and spending days on end in the yards. And they saw that passion come through with the Aqua Mekong. And I think as I lead that way, they saw that the, we put our blood, sweat and tears into these ships. Every, every ship we build, even though it's five and it's been nothing, you know, we never bite off more than we can chew these are labors of love and so the way I take care of our crew the way we take care of our crew the way we take care of our ship they've seen that kind of passion come through and I think that's the same way that they knew we expected them to uh, to take care of the building process of the Aquaneta and they've delivered with no hesitation so. thank you so much Francesco do, do you want to share any final message to our audience no I'm just uh, super excited about the industry we're in I'm committed as ever to this industry and and really uh, more in love than ever with the, the destinations that we operate in South America has obviously be a, been where I started and where my passion will always lie but we've had to grow the business and look forward to welcoming the the industry supporters uh, our clients and our guests in the future so thanks for the opportunity to share my story fantastic thank you so much Francesco have a good night there in Singapore now we are thank moving you from Singapore to La Paz. Bye-bye, Francesco. Ciao, ciao, ciao. So we are going to Bolivia now to hear a different story, also about isolation and resilience. So the third speaker of the day is Bolivia travel expert, Jeanette Simbron. Jeanette decided to change her routine and projects once she saw herself locked down at home for months in a row. And Jeanette also reframed her own goals and decided to invest in regenerative tourism. I step forward the sustainable and responsible tourism we all have tried to To present her story, how isolation opened our internal doors to reframe our goals, I am happy to invite our dear Jeanette Simbron. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. For, for me, it's a very pleasure to be with all of you. And it has been a very hard process, I guess, so in the life of all of us. But also it was a very nice period in our lives to uh, stay quiet a little bit and stop a little bit and try to reflect about what is life in reality. So let me share with you my screen and show you a little bit of what this time brings to my life. For some reason, okay. Uh, well, in reality, what am I going to talk to you about uh, today? It's about how insulation made us change uh, our goals. I work in tourism since I was very young, 23 years I had when I began to work. And I decided to promote my country, small, tiny country with a lot of prejudice and preconcepts. And I traveled all over the world, sometimes with my family, 
sometimes alone, trying to show it to promote the beautiness of my country, but, at the, but beyond everything, uh, the sustainability and independent company that I have. But in this process of having a sustainable and independent company, I also was working in my personal independency and my personal autonomy and the personal capacity that I had to show and to promote a country like Bolivia. Suddenly, and the persons that they know me, they know that I'm very a speedy person, that I love to talk and I love to go around, I love to go up, down. I usually I travel almost 120 days per year uh, from from Japan to Dubai and from Bolivia to wherever. And some of the time, more than 140 days per year, I'm not at home. And suddenly the isolation came and all the, all the world was in trouble and obviously my person also. And suddenly my wings had been cut and my independence uh, has been a, a little bit uh, affected. And there, uh, my emotions come over. Happiness for some times, because I was at home with my kids, with my husband. Then frustration, the company hasn't given us the money, the, the, the business, the quotes, cancellations, and all of these uh, things bring us lots of sadness. Frequently, we have joy to be in the garden for more than three, four years. Then anger because all of the things could we, that we were planning to do this year uh, were not going to be done in the time that we pretend. Hope, I was mm, implementing my glamping project around Bolivia and suddenly um, the project had to stop, but I had the hope sometime we could do it. Pride, because after three or four months, the company was there. After five months, the company was there. My team was there. And everyone, everyone begins to learn to work remote. Fear, because we didn't and we still don't know what's going on. And I began to evaluate myself. You know, at the beginning of this period, first of all, was the company, the business, uh, everything that was outside. And then after two or three months, I began to analyze and think and evaluate about who I am. What am I doing? What does happening, happiness means to me? What is the purpose in my life? Am I really promoting a change? Am I really doing what I want to do in terms of achieving my personal goals? What are those goals? And those questions come back again and again. And then everything I cook. I usually don't cook. <laughs> I bake. Oh, my gosh. Almost 20 years in my life that I didn't do something like that. Clean, read, learn, exercise, yoga, and repeat and repeat and repeat. And this process uh, that I was living, that I'm still living in some way, I was doing inside my words, inside my house. I was feeling protected in my house with my team, with my family. I was being protected inside of what I feel that was saving me from the virus, from the COVID. And lately, after three months <laughs> of thinking of having this relaxing and analyzing period, uh, I need to reset. I need a reinvention. I need to think of those goals that has been me uh, analyzing the goal, the, the, the target, what I was going to do and the things. And then I began to create and I began to feel this emotion that I usually have when I travel. And I decided to do a company with my sister. I create a blog because I wasn't, I wasn't feel confident about my photography. So I create a blog called The Doors that I began to take photographs about doors in the past. Uh, my, the company with my sister is a company focusing cold pressed juices, fruits, fruits, vegetables, very healthy, because this is something that I really want to achieve in my personal life also. I decided to support my community, very uh, local people that live in the jungle in Bolivia, that they really were affected because of the virus. So I put all my efforts to to try to bring them some, some support. I need to get close to my 
closest friends, something that I couldn't have the opportunity, the connection with the others, but the real interaction, that was something that brings me these four or five months to period in my, in my life. And then in this analyzing period and trying to rediscover who I am and trying to analyze where, who, who reality wants to be in life, regenerative tourism comes to my life. And suddenly, as the doors were closing before, the doors begins to be to open. And I began to think that I can do more, we can do more. We can go beyond sustainability and uh, in environmental things. That's something that I work in my country since, since Bolivia Millenaria has been created. We can discover any way of doing things. We can try to build things in a better way. We can rethink what we are doing and we can be able to epic. This is one of my images. This is one of my photographs. So I began to be more confident of what I want really to achieve. And the isolation also, not just brings breath to the planet, it also brings the breath to us. And so I guess in this period, all of us, we began to breathe in a better way to try to inspire ourselves what we want to do and when we want to do. This is one of my, this is one of the glampings that we, we have in La Paz. This is just 40 minutes from La Paz. And the regenerative tourism, I guess so, will help us, all of us, to open our eyes, to be part of something, a community as remoters, that we have a feeling of everybody, we can do things in the same way, in a respectful way. We can think green, be more sustainable, get involved with other realities, not thinking under our comfort zone and trying that we have everything. So open a little bit with, with uh, our eyes and to think and reflect that other can be able to, um, to receive our support, not just money, support. Understand the value of simplicity and the connections, live real experiences, beginning to get deeper in my personal vision. Bolivia Millenaria has been working all of these years in some of those things, but now we understand and we build up these four months to do it in a deeper way. And I learned a lot in this period. Changes start with me. I cannot wait that the changes start with others. I need to uh, begin to think in a collective way, not just in an individual way. I have to be a holistic vision about tourism and about the efforts that we need to do it as a community, as a person, as a company, for the rest of what am I doing, for the people that I work with, for the people that I'm going to create experiences, for, the, for my colleagues, for my team, create real cooperation, reduce the boundaries, create a meaningful travel experiences that really, really can help us to change not just the vision of the visions of the suppliers, also the visions of the people that's buying the services. Learn the bonding between every little element. If something goes down, we everybody can be able to help them put up, collaborate and restore. This is something that I learned. This is my team. And this was a very, very impressive, hard period. But at the same time, it was an impressive period of that we need to change, we need to do it. So I wasn't see the, the five months and something quarantine in Bolivia as something hard. No, I, 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 it was challenging to stay home for five months. I guess it was challenging more for all of them, the ones that you see, the three guys, than for me. <laughs> for me, it was very nice and pleasant, but I guess for them it was a little bit hard to have mom at home for so many for so many months but at the same time all of us will learn we learn that in the turbulence we need to create a change this is what i can be able to give you for today thank you thank you to all of you to to listen to us and to help us to regenerate the tourism it's in our hands we can do it and we are able to develop a new way of tourism but in a real unique and authentic way Jeanette, we do hope the tourism will be greener, smarter, and less crowded once the pandemic is finished. 
And we uh, here in remote, we totally believe there is no other way than practicing sustainable to travel, responsible travel, and now regenerative travel, which is nothing less than working to leave the places we visit better than we found them, right? So, Correct. Correct. That's it. And, and, and Jeanette, we have, we have a few uh, quick questions for you before we go to our uh, coffee break. Um, how hard is to be a leader as a woman and uh, an indigenous descendant in Latin America? Well, it's very, it's, it has been completely hard the last 20 years. That's the reason that I live with three guys and uh, and it's also harder because especially for my husband, I think so. Uh, but it, it is a, we believe we live in a macho society that being a uh, woman and I began very young, I was 23 years when I began the company, it was harder also. But the most important thing is that it's not a gender thing. I guess it's a purpose of creating cooperation and this is something that we uh, we create in the company we decided not to be the biggest Bolivian company we decided not to be the the, the the greatest one we decided to be the better one and that's what we can be able to do understanding that we need to be equal not nothing is better nothing is less we need to be equal and that is the main difference I think so all right and uh, I'm gonna ask the same question. What was the toughest moment for you during the pandemic and how did you manage it? Being at home. <laughs> Being at home for so many months, I guess so. It was the harder period, but I managed very well. I cook, I bake, I learn, I yoga, I did yoga. So that was the toughest pro uh, process, I think. So and suddenly believe that uh, the, the, the tourism was not there because it was this, this the most important thing uh, in my life during this last 23 years but still there we are still here the company is still here um i'm with the same energy as always and so i guess it's the most important thing all right and uh, Jeanette, how can your customers work to leave bolivia a better place when traveling to your country sustainability is not just a word Sustainability means deeper than that, means respectful, no? And regenerative tourism means also the opportunity to travel uh, to repair the harm that we do to, the, to, to our ecosystems. I guess so with the regenerative, we have to travel to interact, to respect, to value, and to get deep in the places that we're going. The experiential travel needs to transform the way that we're doing things, and I guess so the the passengers needs to uh, comply in a better way, in a balanced way, from both sides, from, from both sides, the products that we offer and the products that they receive. And it's a back forth thing in terms of responsibility. I guess so that is the, the key factor. Okay. Thank you, Jeanette. Could, could you just uh, share any final message to, to our audience before we leave? Yes, we need to improve the conditions and equal life of the people, and it's in our hands. We need to create a better planet. The planet uh, has been changing so so long since we uh, we were stopping, and guess and I guess we can do in a better but in a responsible way. No, thank you, thank you to all of you. Thank you so much, Janet. Uh, it was great to hear you. We are now going to stop for a break, uh, like a 10 minute break, and we are going to be back for the second part of our remote seed session. It's going to be about leadership in tough times. If you uh, guys in the audience want to stay uh, here, we will have a stretching and relaxation session. It's going to be with our uh, guest, Veronica Garcia. Veronica is a body and mind educator and will bring some useful tips for those who spend too many hours in front of the computer, which is probably our case, right? So see you in 10 minutes. Welcome, dear Veronica. I'm here ready to stretch. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Danielle. After these inspiring talks, I will give you a pocket class that will allow you to take care of your body even if you just have a few minutes per day. And especially if you spend most of your day sitting on a chair.
So I will also give you some breathing techniques that will allow you to control your emotions. The first technique will get you more relaxed and less stressed. And if you have an important meeting or a big day at your job, you can use this technique to feel relaxed or less stressed and can you work properly. The other technique will give you more energy and focus so you can skip your last cup of coffee or you can combine with your coffee and have like a burst of energy. I don't know. But you can control your emotions, just breathe in and out. And it's a, like a chemical reaction in your body. So it's like a magic, you know, with just simple movements and breathing in and out, you can do so good for your body and your mind. So let's get it started. But first I want to congratulate Remote Team to have this initiative. And because I, especially, I think that every single second that we have to take care of our bodies is like a gift and to take care of ourselves and our health. So congratulate to Remote Team for giving us this opportunity. So let's do movement as medicine and let's get started. First, we're going to do a big movement with our shoulders backwards like this, we're going to do circles and we're going to do it 10 times, one, two, three, four, five, halfway there, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, now we're going to switch sides and go forward, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's very important to do it big so you can relax all this part of your body. Now we're gonna put your head to your side just like this and relax your head and let gravity do its job. And breathe and change sides and breathe now you're gonna do a small circle with your head front of your body and come back and swap sides and come back very good you're gonna open your arms and cross it in front of your body and stretch your chest and you're gonna do it faster like 10 times one two three four five six seven eight nine ten very good now you're gonna relax again your head and cross your fingers just like that, put on your head and just do small movement, make movements with your head, saying no. Please respect your body. If you feel any pain, just stop what you're doing. Each body are different. So respect and listen to your body. Okay, come back slowly. Very good. Now we're gonna do some movements for your hands because we are typing a lot those days, especially with pandemic situations and everything is online, meetings and social meetings and work stuff. So we're gonna do open and close your hands. Very, very strong movements. And we're gonna do it 20 times. I know you want to stop, please don't stop, and I, I can see you, but I can feel if you stop, okay? So don't stop. Now you're going to put your arms up and keep doing it. 
please don't stop and please do it with energy. And now I know that you are feeling your muscles, but don't stop doing it. Feeling your muscles is a good thing, you know? It's not a motive for you to stop. Just keep doing it. Come on, you can do it. And the last thing, don't stop. Yes, we are almost there. And now relax. It's very good for your hand, very good for your fist. You should feel all those muscles over here. Very good. Now we're gonna stretch our hands. You're gonna put your fingers down, just like that, very slowly and switch fingers very good you're gonna switch your hand now and you should do it every day it's just few minutes and if you do it every day everything will be better in your body you're gonna feel more positive you're gonna feel more energy you know it's really good okay now i'm gonna stretch your whole hand Put all your things back, just like that, and hold. And now swap hands. Now we're gonna do the opposite. We're gonna put all your things backwards, just like that. Make sure your arm is up and not down, because it makes difference on your movement stretch and change sides very good now we're gonna do a body reach sides it's for a stretch on your body so if your chair has like these arms you can go to the front of the chair and you reach and come back your legs participating of your movement. Reach and come back. Reach and come back. It's for it's stretching all this part of your body. Reach and come back. Reach and come back. Look up to your head and let's do it 10 times. One, two, three, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Very good. Now it's like a challenge, okay? We're gonna put our hands and do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Very good. Relax. I'll teach you some brief techniques. The techniques will be uh, for you to use all your days. This one is to relax you. So give me a brief that is really deep breath. Okay, you breathe in and you're gonna hold for four seconds and you're gonna breathe out and hold for four seconds as well. And if you can, you should feel your air in your belly. So you breathe in and hold. One, two, three, four. And breathe out and hold. One, two, three, four. Breathe in and hold. One, two, three, four. Breathe out and hold. One, two, three, four. Breathe in. Hold one, two, three, four. Breathe out and hold one, two, three, four. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. And breathe out. Very good. Now feel how, how your body feels, how your body is react, reacting to Okay, this one should relax you. I will give you 
some focus and energy to the next talks, okay? You should uh, uh, align your hands to your shoulders, put it up, and let it get down. And you're gonna do a short breathing uh, with your nose and releasing with your mouth. So we're gonna do like, and you're gonna do it 20 times. should give you more energy and focus and I hope you enjoy practicing that and I hope you have more energy and focus for the next talks. That's it. Hello, welcome back everyone. Here we are again for the second and last part of today's session. For those who are not online on time for our opening ceremony, I'd like to quickly introduce our core team who worked very hard to present this event today. My partners, Roberto and Ligia, Marcelo, our Exhibitors Relations Manager, and Danielle, our Content Manager. We talk so much about human connections in our events. So I guess you can imagine how bad we are missing to see everybody offline actually. But that's what we have for now. And I'm sure many of you had to deal with this same feeling over the last few months. Difficult situations or even very tough decisions to take. Very much related to that, for the second part of our session, we decided to bring three community members to talk about leadership in tough times. Although leadership has been a trendy top topic for years, we are living a completely new chapter of humanity and being a leader all of a sudden has become even more challenging. I invite Danielle back to introduce us a little bit more about the next remote seats. Thank you, Clara. So our next speaker of the day is Douglas Simões, our local expert from Pure Brazil. Douglas has a very interesting story about how we can give something back to the communities we work with. For many years, Douglas has worked on a partnership with the leaders of the favela Pereira da Silva in Rio de Janeiro. Douglas is going to present his lessons from a Rio Favela's collective leadership. Dear Douglas, please welcome. Hi, Daniel. Hi, everybody. So thanks uh, very much for uh, the invitation to be here to talk about Mohinho Project. Uh, I will share my screen. So let me see if I can do that. Yes. So. I will talk uh, here today about Mojino that basically is the history, is the story of uh, 10 young artists. Actually, today, not that young anymore, but um, that uh, started this project at Favela Pereira da Silva. Uh, so let's talk first about the favela itself. Most of the time, uh, favela in people's mind means a place with no structure, with violence and poverty. Uh, but when you go deeper in the favela, we can see much more than that. And what we've seen in these years, together with these, these young artists and the community that is there, 
its resilience, creativity, <clears throat> opportunity, learning, and art. And in the case of Favela Pereira da Silva, we can even see great views, as we can see in the top left um, picture. But then, how we, our story, merge with their story? Um, we, in 19, uh, sorry, first of all, what's Mourinho then, okay? Uh, Mourinho started when a, film, a filmmaker uh, was visiting the favela in 1997. And this guy found some kids uh, uh, playing with toys with uh, a model that was made by them with bricks and left behind construction items uh, to create the atmosphere, to create um, the, the favela itself in a small scale. So we could see in these models, uh, bars, shops, restaurants, and everything. But when he got these images, uh, this, this filmmaker, and took to a TV show, these um, young artists, they start to be invited to exhibit their art uh, on the following years in other places of Brazil, but also in other places of the world. And they could become a very positive uh, um, influence in the favela for the younger kids. So these artists, they've been in several countries, so including England, Spain, France, US, East Timor, exhibiting their art. Then in 2007, we were looking as a company to a place where we could show this side of Rio de Janeiro, but not as a bad place as with, without infrastructure, but as a place of solutions and opportunities. And they were looking for someone uh, or, or looking for a way to show their, their community, to show their favela, um, but not only to take their art to other places, but to bring visitors to their favela. So that's how we started together with them to bring tourists. And nowadays, actually now they have stopped for the COVID, but this year they are opening again with all the protocols necessary. They started to receive visitors, not only from our company, but from any company or anyone who can visit, who can contact them direct and do it. Uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we just realized that for places like a favela, this is just another crisis. They have crises like that every day. While myself and probably most of this audience this is the crisis for us because this is something unique. We never heard, we never faced something like that. But people in the favela, they are resilient every day. They need to do that because that's part of their life. Uh, just at the beginning of the, the COVID-19 problem, they could create with other NGOs around them and other communities, a donation campaign that was made really quick with horizontal decisions and trust in each other and they could help with basic items, food, hygiene, and protection kits, lots of people from these communities. On a second moment, we, together with them, we created a, um, a campaign that we called I Support Mohingo Project. The idea was to keep the artists, keep doing their art. The idea was to sell, as Remote Latin America bought one, uh, bricks, virtual bricks that would be placed at the model that they've got there. So who don't, who make the donations now, they've got their names or their company names on their model, which is there. So because of this resilience, these organizations, this innovation and everything that it happens in the favela, the numbers on the favela on COVID-19 are really low. So until now, with 10,000 people living there, they had only three cases and no death at all. So along these 13 years that we are connected with them, we learned a lot and it's really important for how we manage the company right now. First of all, we learned that we need to act more and complain less. Favelas, most of the time, they are forgotten by the government. So they need to sort out their own problems and Mohinho is one a good example of that. The second thing is that in our lives, Simple decisions can take months to be made on planning, meetings, calls, and things like that. On the favela, they have a problem to solve one, each other, uh, one after the other. So they need to do things very quick. So that's the way that we should do also in our company. 
And the 400 square meters model that is being shaped, that is being shaped by continuous contribution, there is no a big plan for that, you know? So they just built up parts of it that was in the beginning and that is now, it's right nowadays. So it makes us to understand that a process is a combination of actions. So if each one do each, your part of it, you can have the full process together. So just to leave a last message for, for this, just as in business or life, each brick we place in the model is an important part of the whole thing. So thank you very much. So much, Douglas. It's great to see how much we can learn and help when working with the communities we visit while we are traveling. And so we are not going to have the Q&A uh, right now because Douglas is going to be with us for the panel in a few uh, moments. So we are going now to our next guest, who is, which is Zach Rabiner, uh, the local expert from Journey Mexico. Uh, Zach had experienced a challenge similar to this pandemic years ago when Mexico had to face the crisis caused by H1N1. So today, Zach will share the speech leading with trans transparency, vulnerability, and compassion. Thanks for joining us, Zach. Please welcome. Thanks, Daniel. Um, hello, everyone, and great to be together again. Um, yeah, so I felt like, uh, you know, we discussed a lot about uh, what we thought at the time was really bad fortune, but it turned out to be good fortune that we had to go through uh, a similar type of pandemic back in 2009. Uh, we had H1N1, which was popularly known as the swine flu and was largely purported to have an origin in Mexico. So Mexico was the birthplace, supposedly, uh, of the swine flu. And later it became known that actually it started in somewhere in upstate New York. But um, yeah, unfortunately that wasn't a retraction that was soon enough. So we had very similar behavior of the market. We had all of our bookings canceled. Uh, we had a complete stop of business. We had to uh, refocus on, on many things. So I, I'm going to uh, share my screen here. And uh, let's see here, we're gonna go to, uh, it's not showing. Okay, well, uh, I'm not clear why, but let's just continue then. Um, okay, um, so uh, we uh, put together, we had to do many things, many things that are very useful for our current situation. Um, the first thing was cash is king, right? Um, and everyone knows how important that is right now uh, as business slowed and then stopped the ground to a halt uh, everyone needed to cut costs and unfortunately the hardest part of that was uh, in fact uh, letting people go people who we didn't want to let go that, that's a very difficult uh, situation uh, we also had to uh, reduce every single line item in our uh, budget I'm sure that you've all done that as well uh, let, let me just see if I can, uh, one last time, try and share this. Hold on. There we go. Great. Fantastic. Um, so, here we are. Um, I think you can see now. There we go. Full screen. Okay. Great. Um, and... Uh, you know, this was a true pandemic. As you can see, uh, we had hundreds of thousands of deaths around the world. Uh, so cash is king, right? Reducing costs. Then we had to deal with all the cancellation policies. All of this information, I think we've covered in previous remote talks. Um, we focused on niche markets and niche product. Uh, niche markets, I think we're all aware of how important the domestic market is. Uh, niche products. And now that business is beginning to return, private homes, private villas, uh, more remote, active adventures. We're seeing all of that, right? Uh, we have all of this information 
summarized in uh, kind of a, a case study that we shared very early on with the remote community and Daniel and the team and Roberto can, uh, we have it actually archived in the remote archives and we'll be glad to show it and share it. Um, I, I actually sent it to our colleagues in China and then in Italy and then around the world uh, in the hopes that it would be helpful. It was just really a summary of our own experience with uh, the things that we learned, some of them through good planning, some of them by luck, some of them by, most of them by making mistakes and then finally finding the right way. Um, and then the, the whole challenge of how do you market, how do you communicate uh, with the market, with your clients, with your suppliers, with your colleagues, with your team, uh, when it's really pretty tone deaf and pretty silly to be uh, trying to sell travel in the midst of a pandemic, right? So it had much more to do, and I think we all, we all got this, right, about being vulnerable, about being honest, about being transparent. Um, and we quickly realized that the only thing that we have in these moments is people's trust in us. Uh, and it's one of the only things that we can control. We can't control the pandemic. We can't know when it's going to end. We can't understand how the market will recover, but we can control the way we communicate, how we communicate um, to our clients, to our suppliers, to our colleagues in the industry, and most importantly, uh, to our team. So these things, as I said, are in, uh, in, in a whole summary, a case study, if you will, of what we did. Finally, the marketing piece, right? Uh, once the market comes back, which for some countries is happening sooner than others right now, uh, you do turn to marketing product and those products will be perhaps different uh, after H1N1, it wasn't very different, but right now I think it is because we're still in the pandemic. Um, and, and what we, all of that we learned previously, but where I think that we've really grown and learned much more this time around is about, uh, how we communicate within our own team and to the larger market, again, clients, suppliers, colleagues, press, industry, but the team. The team really i think th this has been such a massive challenge on so many levels for the whole world personal business family uh health wise everything right so um we focused a lot on that and in fact uh my executive team who consists of my wife rebecca who is our cfo and co-founder with me and mateo uh, and brady we, we got together and we discussed that my role had to become uh, really just focused on culture of the company. How are we gonna keep people healthy psychologically, uh, emotionally, and not just people, but ourselves, right? I mean, we were really all pretty freaked out. Uh, and, and as we know now, this pandemic is much longer, much deeper, much broader, affecting many more countries. Um, so, the idea of culture and community became a major focus. So some of the things that we did uh, is we decided that we were going to share numbers like we never did before, really, really transparent. And uh, you know, we, we had to reduce our staff from 64 people down to 23. There's uh, two or three people, uh, Jessica VNA and Jenny, who aren't in this uh, photo, but uh, we're now a 23 person team. Uh, and we are all on reduced salaries too. So hard to keep motivated. How do you keep people together? We began using technology like we all are, like we are right now, Zooms and Microsoft Teams and so on. But we did it at a macro level with our whole team. And we did it really on a micro level with all of the leadership team reaching out on a very regular basis to our teams and to the larger company to check in, not just about uh, you know, how's work going and how's your to-do list and, and how are you coming along with the, the goals that we have, but how are you personally? How's it working at home? How are your kids? How's your family? First and foremost, how's your health and how's the health of your family, right? Um, and I have to say it's been fascinating, the results, because we are closer than we ever have been on all levels. And in fact, we we already had some we're all working from home right now, but we already had several remote uh, team members, right? Who we have someone in England, we have someone in Houston, we have someone in Cabo, you know, we have four offices in Mexico. Um, and everybody has mentioned 
that how much better we're working together. And the surprising thing is not just that we're much closer and in, in, in closer communication with those who are working remotely, but we're even in closer communication with those who we worked in the same space with. Um, and that was a surprise that we're, we're just really focused on connecting, on being present, um, on really managing each other's expectations. We all know when someone has to take uh, their children to the doctor or what the different uh, things are. And we're no longer bound, right, by a nine to five work schedule, but we're even more conscious of our accountability to each other. So I mentioned the numbers. Um, we shared numbers, right? We want to get everyone back. The first priority is to get everyone back to full salaries. We made uh, metrics, we made goals that we have to get to and we're sharing them with the performance of the company so that it's no longer an arbitrary idea. When, uh, you know, when is the executive team gonna reestablish salaries? No, it's when are we as a team going to hit these goals? And it really is driving performance. People want to sell one more deal. They wanna operate better. They want better feedback. They wanna operate the budget better. So uh, that's really interesting. Uh, we also uh, have, quite an interesting experience with uh, initially because of the incredible impact that this whole scenario had on our, our major uh, centers of where we have our offices, our big tourist centers, right? Uh, Los Cabos, Puerto Vallarta, Mexico City, and Cancun. The economies of these places, aside from Mexico City, especially dependent on tourism. So we started uh, donating some meals to local families. Well, when we told this to our clients, uh, they all of a sudden wanted to contribute to this. So what happened as a really grassroots optional uh, thing that some of our team were doing turned into a program where we gave more than 100,000 meals to vulnerable families. And this again, talking about culture. So people saw that we were really concerned about our larger community. And then we're checking in as well on each other all the time and finding out how are you doing uh, physically, emotionally, psychologically, and responding to when people have an issue or they come up against a challenge and each person is different. So really like a case by case type of thing. Um, so uh, yeah, between the meals, which then went into our larger culture of awareness and concern about our larger community, we also uh, became aware that people were really facing a lot of anxiety as, as the time wore on. It wasn't just a month or two months or three months. What are we now, six, seven months into this, um, people started to really get anxious and worried. And as COVID grew in certain destinations or others, and uh, so we started a wellness program where we broadcast three times a week, uh, breathing and flexibility and meditation uh, for the whole team. And it's optional. So anybody who wants to come, but again, it's this idea that we are all in this and we showed a lot of vulnerability ourselves and a lot of concern trying to be leaders, trying to be strong, but also being honest and being vulnerable and being transparent about our own doubts and our own concerns. And I think this has uh, created a commitment and a, a strength within our team that we never even had before. And I do see us coming out of this even stronger uh, than we were prior to the pandemic and hopefully with lots more opportunities and lots of uh, future successes in store. So uh, that is, uh, that, yeah, that, that rounds it up. Let me stop sharing my screen. Um, but it's it's been uh, quite, quite interesting, I have to say. Thank you so much, Zach. That was very interesting and, and useful. And we, we, we all know we have learned a lot, a lot from the crisis and being transparent about our, about our challenges as teams, as companies, and as human beings helps a lot in our, our relationships. Well, our next story of the day is another great example of why showing vulnerability actually proves our strength to ourselves and to others. I'm talking about this story from Enrique Umbert, CEO of Mountain Lodge of Peru. Enrique faced a series of personal matters in a short period of time. He suffered a skin accident, his beloved father has passed away, and Enrique Sr. was the founder of MLP and a fantastic person. And of course, Enrique, the son, had to face the current pandemic. Yeah, sometimes life confronts us with many challenges at the, at the same time, 
and Hickey had to face another personal challenge last week, and unfortunately, we will not be able to be here with us today. We are sorry for that. His presence is always so positive and inspiring, but we are happy at the same time because Enrique sent his sister, Natalie, who is in charge of the marketing department of, at Mountain Lodge of Peru to replace him. Hi, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you so much to Remote, yeah. Roberto, Daniel, and the whole team for having us. I'm sorry Enrique couldn't be here, but I'm more than happy to fill in for him. Oh, th th thank you so much, you, for joining us, yes. uh, even in this very last minute. Uh, welcome, and please feel free to, to, to bring here what Enrique has to tell to our audience. Yes. Well, I thought that, um, well, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I thought that it was really important that to deliver Enrique's words just as he had written them, because his message, um, my brother is a very deep thinker. <laughs> He's very cool and very, um, he really is a special soul. And um, what I think his experience, obviously, to what Zach was saying in the previous speakers, you know, we, we've had to confront a lot of the, obviously, the challenges, uh, the financial and this and that. But um, I think that also, you know, it, it, it takes a personal toll in a way in terms of thinking, uh, like, am I changing as a leader? All of these things. So I would love to read his words to you. And um, thank you again. All right. Okay. So, um, as you saw, it's, he's titled it An Experience in Self Love and Community Leadership. So, what does it mean to be a leader? Is it having all of the answers and being the smartest person in the room? Is it being the strongest, toughest, or most courageous amongst your peers? Is it being the person who works the most or works the hardest in a group? Is it conceptualizing and delivering the most beautiful and inspiring speeches? Is it simply because you have the authority to make decisions and command the team? These are the things I've been thinking about during this very odd time for all of us. And because our team is so close, I really, really have been focused on coming, hopefully coming to some sort of conclusion. So my team and I have indeed gone through some tremendous adventures together in the 15 years since our business was founded. From life-threatening guest emergencies in the field to devastating natural disasters, to market crashes and financial struggles, surreal health emergencies like SARS, Zika, and of course, COVID-19, and much, much more. Whenever tough times befell our business, as a leader, I always felt compelled to be physically present, no matter what. And no matter how high the mountain, and as a sister, I can attest to this, or how far the destination. Having had more time to sit and ponder the events of the last 15 years during this quarantine, I started thinking, what is the actual value of my determination to be physically present with my team all the time? In attempting to come to some sort of conclusion, I focused on the past few years. And I would like to share three very short interconnected stories with you. In late 2017, my mom was diagnosed with terminal cancer and sadly passed away in early 2018. When she was diagnosed, I rearranged my priorities so that I could spend more quality time with her and help in her care, which caused me to leave my company's headquarters, move my family to Lima, um, and fulfill my role of CEO remotely away from the office, my team, and what felt like light years away from our beloved lodges and staff. A few months later, in mid-2018, while snowboarding in Chile, which I've been doing for 30 years or more, I had a terrible fall and injured my back and right leg very seriously. I went through multiple surgeries to put my leg back together and subsequently spent the following six months in bed, all while negotiating a potential and very positive acquisition of the company, of course, and of course, tending to the usual day-to-day -day and challenges of an ongoing business. And then this year, a week before Peru went into lockdown due to the pandemic, I received a phone call alerting me that my dad had had a skiing accident and was unconscious at an intensive care unit in the US. A few days later, he passed away. I made it back home just before the international borders closed in Peru and went straight into lockdown. Isolated from extended family, 
friends, and my team, of course, while we all faced one of the most unprecedented crises ever. As a leader, I felt out of my comfort zone and worried that my imposed distance from the team, especially during this pandemic, plus the challenge of the survival of our business and the livelihood of more than 250 employees and their families, not to mention the hundreds of other families from the rural communities who we partner with in Cusco and the, in the Highlands. Through all of these personal professional challenges, and not to say that I'm any uh, greater or more of a hero than anyone else, because everything is relative and we all go through things in life. But I struggled because I always felt like I needed to be physically present, and I ended up learning to forgive myself for needing to be absent sometimes. And perfect example, I it used to be ridiculous when I was in the hospital during my leg surgeries, I was, the nurses were giving me my next shot of pain medication and I was still trying to answer emails with my other hand. I just wanted to be there for my team, but could I? While going through all of this, the universe presented me with a unique opportunity to learn and grow as a leader and a person. There's a concept in Andean philosophy called Aini, which in essence means reciprocity. It's a, it supposes that everything in the universe is connected. It is considered by many Andean people actually as the backbone of life, our souls, etc. If you've ever heard the phrase, let go and let God, I'd like you to consider adding another phrase to your handbook. Let go and let them, your community, take care of you. It's not a matter of necessarily power, it's a matter of Aini, reciprocity. I truly believe now that one of the highest expressions of leadership comes from love translated into service. But are we leaders leading by example? I realized that the most important thing, aside from caring for my team, was empowering my team so that I could be absent and I could let go because we're all only human after all. So are we making sure that we love and, and self service ourselves so we can truly love and service others. And acknowledging our vulnerability, holding space and being present for ourselves, especially amidst times of troubles, requires courage and an intentional mindset and faith. It's not easy. Though we'll always feel the need to take care of our community, it's important to realize first that we're part of the community and that by empowering, delegating, teaching, and then trusting that our community we are all a community and one family, then all of these processes take care of themselves through Aini. I'm now faced with, a, not faced, I'm now faced with the most, one of the most exciting double challenges of my life. My second child, Joaquin, was born a week ago. Um, my daughter, Mika, is now seven. And, um, you know, with close family and friends at a safe distance, though, my wife and daughter, and I rely, rely, no, my wife and daughter rely on me tremendously to be present as an integral part of this wonderful family life experience. At the same time, our business is struggling to overcome the most critical part of the crisis. M more months have gone by with no sales income. We've had to make some significant changes in the team and how we do things. And there's still uncertainty regarding the recovery period for the tourism industry in Peru, as you all know. My brain is assessing risk. That's our biological survival instinct kicking in, but my heart and my spirit now know exactly what I have to do to care for my team, but also for letting them care for me since we are all a family and a community. And thank you so much for allowing me to share this part of my life with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. What a speech, very emotional. And thanks, thank you for coming. And please thank Enrique for sending this message. Enrique, if you are watching us, we miss you. <laughs> <laughs> no, he was definitely disappointed not to be able to participate today. But as my father taught us years ago, family first. Yeah, perfect. We totally understand. Okay. Natalie, thank you so much. And thanks to everyone. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. So our travel show must go on. And it's now time for our panel, Leadership in tough times. And today we're going to have three great panelists. As Enrique Humbert will not have the chance to be with us, 
we are going to have as a great substitute our director and founder, Alberto Bittemann. So I would like to open the panel and invite back to the screen Douglas Simões from Pure Brazil, Zach Rabinor from Journey Mexico, and Roberto Bittemann from Remote Latin America. Thank you, guys. So before we start, just a few things to cover. We are opening for questions and comments from the audience. Uh, so please just type your questions and we are going to be happy to forward them to the panelists. The panelists can ask questions uh, to each other. And this panel is being recorded as well as all the speeches at remote talks and remote seats. And they will be available on our YouTube channel later on. Uh, so to start the discussion, we have already watched Douglas and Zach's presentations a few minutes ago, but we didn't hear Roberto's story as a leader during the pandemic. So I would like to ask first to Roberto, and, but the question is the same to Douglas and Zach. Uh, Roberto, what was the toughest moment for you as a leader in the independent uh, tourism industry in this pandemic, and how did you manage it? Hello, everybody. Nice to be with Zach. Douglas and all of you here in the community. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, I think the the most difficult part of the pandemic, besides having the two children at home 24 hours a day, like <laughs> all the days of the week, but regarding to 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 the travel industry, for sure the toughest moment for for me uh, as a co-leader was to to have to to postpone the event and to accept that uh, we we could not do the event where we were supposed to do in Cafayati in 2019 it was a really really hard decisions and even though we are not 100% focused on an event we have all the activities during throughout the year but this event uh, means a lot to us and it's like 18 months of planning and traveling and, and talking about and discussing and creating and, and and searching, you know exactly what I'm talking about, Daniel. Uh, but uh, so this is this was certainly the, the toughest moment for me. But uh, wh what I realized is that uh, once we accepted this fact and we had to, but uh, for, for many people, including ourselves, sometimes it takes a while since we accept the fact. But once we accept the fact, things uh, become much clearer. Uh, I wouldn't say much easier, probably, but uh, at least much, much clearer. And, and, and it has to be something like a new one. It's not like a postponement. We have to think on creating something from the zero. So, and it gives us energy to start uh, uh, fighting again and, 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 and working hard again and dreaming again. Because if we are thinking, oh, we couldn't do the event and let's do it next year, so like it's going to be a postponement and whatever, it's going to be something that may, maybe depresses us. And we are, from some months, uh, like some months ago, we took the decision we have to make this event in the same place it was supposed to be, but it's a new one. It's not the same event we, we, we are planning. We are planning something <laughs> from zero, and we are very motivated on this. So we made the from the toughest thing on the pandemic a, 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 a an opportunity that are really making us feel enthusiastic. Thank you. So, Zach, uh, when, when I yeah, no, I wanted to. I wanted to just ask you. Uh, well, I guess it's the same. Uh, it's really the same question to all of us. Um, I think uh, the toughest moments. Th there are two toughest moments for me. Uh, one was having to let go of so many team members who we didn't want to let go. This was the most painful part. Uh, you know, we were at the most successful moment in our company's history. We had an amazing team that was refined and chosen and improved over 18 years of operation, 17 years of operation. And then to have to say goodbye to these people, or at least uh, hopefully to see them soon when we can bring them back, but unknowing, that was, that was one. The second uh, was really the questioning and this is where i was thinking a lot about roberto and uh, all of you at remote 
we all questioned and we continue to question as we go forward, is this still viable? Is this business still going to be a business? Is there still demand for our services? And I think in the case of event organizers or where you receive the most of your revenue from making events, it's a very, very scary question. And I see you all being creative, innovative, doing new things, and I salute that. But even for us, who we believe, and, and in fact, in Mexico, I think we're fortunate, we've seen, we already have business coming back because Mexico is open and we have, although very reduced, we have business that has continued. Uh, we did really think, is it worth it to wait one, two, three years? How much money do we have to spend, you know, doing the, the, the financial calculations? But the thing that keeps us focused and the way that we've found real strength is that what we do with Journey Mexico is actually not a business, it's a mission. And when you're driven by a purpose and a mission, which in my case, and I think we in, in, on the screen and in our remote community all share, we have a mission to share our destinations, our experiences and share the deep transformation that travel has had on each one of us individually with the world, with the larger uh, community, then it becomes easy to know what to do. Because when you're, when you're searching from a mission and from a vision and from uh, values, then there is nothing else to do. Douglas, wanna share your point? <laughs> Yes, I mean, uh, well, first of all, hi, Roberto. Hi, Zach. Great to be here with you two, especially. Of course, with Daniel as well, but these two good friends. Um, I would say that there, there were three moments that were hard, not different in terms of like harder or not. The first one, I flew to United States in March 9th. And then I was planning to be there for 15 days. Then I had to change everything in the middle of the trip. And when I was coming back, I was worried to not be able to come home in time. I mean, because I had to took four different flights instead of two, because my flights were canceling. I was trying to get new ones. So this, this time was really hard that I was wondering, um, I might be staying here in the US away from my family for a while. So that was really hard. The second one was when we, uh, me and my partner, we were talking about how can we pay the people who work with us, our staff, you know, because the same of Zach. I mean, in, in, the, in the final, and this moment was magic for us because we talked with the staff and we asked them to say, how can we help each other? And each one reduce how much was possible for each one, for each I mean, because the people has different situations. So how can I decide to cut 30% of all salaries, 50% of low salaries, lay off some people and not the others? So we open the, the, the conversation saying, look, we need to help everybody. So how can you help us and we will help you? And we manage to keep the whole staff until the end of September. And now we just lay off one person. All the rest are guaranteed until the end of December, okay? And the third time was talking about the communities and the providers like guides, people that are not under our umbrella on monthly basis. So Mojinho was one of the things because these, these, these people on the last, uh, the final line of the process, they, they are freelancers. So how can we help them? And then we could manage in certain ways to help a bit, not as much as we wanted our guides and some of the guides, and also Mohinho project. So these three moments were really hard for us. Of course, there was other small things, small, smaller things, but these three moments were really, really hard for us. Fantastic. Uh, um, Zach's question, um, should, uh, maybe you guys want, want, want to answer what uh, Zach was uh, asking. Uh, is there any uh, other way for, for us who work with tourism, in, in our case, Roberto, we produce events. Uh, would you like to bring a, an answer to this challenging question? I don't, I don't, I don't have this, this answer, but I, but I, but I will try and, and share a bit of what I think. Uh, 
uh, regarding the, the the event specifically, what you, what is we are like more known for 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 many years. Uh, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be tough. I think people are not planning to travel uh, a lot yet, and even when things are, became a, a little bit more similar to what it was before the pandemic. I think people will not uh, travel on the same way, even the travel professionals. I think people, uh, of course, they will travel and they will, they will want to travel, maybe not more, but better. So what we are focused, besides all the, the planning we have already before the pandemic, but we, it becomes much, much uh, more uh, solid now, it's to, to, to become a, a, current, a current platform throughout the year, to have many other actions that we can deliver and connect uh, between the community. But uh, we are investing a lot on creating a new experience for our event, because Probably people won't come to our event, being a, a, a property, being a boat, being a, sea, a travel designer or whatever, or even a, a, a speaker, uh, if it's not really worthy. So, okay, we have, I think we, we had four good events in, in the past four years, but I think we have to go further. We have to, to invest a lot, of, a lot of energy on creating uh, not only a perfect event, but a perfect pre-event or a perfect post event and putting our community even more together and give and, and creating spaces that that, that 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 all the participants will say oh I won't miss it. I won't miss it so we have to go much much further because people think people will travel less times but on but we we'll try to, to travel better so that's what we are we'll try to do thank you Roberto so in case any of you guys have a question to each other, just... Uh, I would, sorry, I would like just to comment the Zach's question uh, very briefly. Um, I see, I'm dying to travel, you know? So I see people in Brazil, as probably similar to Mexico, we have a domestic travel very strong and the people are starting to travel again, okay? So I see people traveling and the people are dying to travel. I, so I see once we have something as a, like 80% of a solution for the COVID-19 uh, vaccine or any medicine that helps, the people will travel again. I mean, it takes time. I don't know how much time, but the people will travel again. As far as I see here in Brazil, the people are traveling already, okay? And, but uh, as a business, um, instead of trying to think when it's going to happen and what's going to be the day after of the crisis, we decided to open more doors. So we were doing only incoming, and now we are doing incoming, waiting for the clients, because we don't have any clients coming yet. We are uh, doing cycle trips close to Sao Paulo city with two new trips. We are uh, doing uh, outdoor training for companies. We are preparing for when companies, the companies are working from home. So once they can, they will start for sure to join these teams together like corporations, team building, things like that on the nature. So um, I think it's another thing. And other products that we are building up. So we have a cruise ship uh, that we charter in Pantanal. We are organizing, uh, we are taking over a uh, commercial side of a local lodge in Bahia and the coastline. So we are open more business to have more options. So that's what we can do right now. So I believe our business will be like with sunshine again, blue sky, once we have these sorted and i'm really optimistic with things and i don't think it's going to be that far but that's my point of view that's fantastic we have a, a question here from arnaldo adne uh, what would you guys want not to change on our your on our way of traveling after the pandemic did you get the question who wants to start I can uh, try. Uh, what not to change? Uh, I mean, I think that we all are here in this community because we believe in the power of remote. So I think that we will not only see this not change, but I think it will grow. We are seeing it already. 
in Mexico that people are coming now and they want to be remote. They don't want to be in urban centers. They don't want to be in dense destinations. They don't want to visit markets or cultural venues or museums. They want to go out and hike. They want to cycle. They want to surf. They want to be in the ocean. They want to be outside. So I think this will not change. And I think this will increase in popularity and the trend will uh, grow. Um, and yeah, I, I, think, uh, I think that's the main thing that will not change for sure. Can I can I just compliment that? I think I totally agree with that with Zach. And something that I had already seen as as a as a kind of a trend in our specific niche, that people were uh, staying longer than maybe 10 years ago uh, on each destination. So on a 10 or 12 day trip, they there are people that do like three or four different destinations, stay two or three nights in different properties and different destinations, uh, maybe including taking a flight between them. But, but I was already uh, realizing people were like, for 10 or 12 days, they would stay only on um, two different destinations. So you have the chance to, to, to interact and to do a much more authentic trip especially because of the people you're going to meet and really meet and, and, and have plenty of time to, to, to stay together. And I think this should, uh, uh, I think the pandemic is going gonna, is gonna to be a, a good power to, to keep it uh, more, uh, for, more uh, for longer stays, I think. That's just to complement your answer, Zach. No, and I can tell you right now, we are seeing it. We have several three-month, four-month, five-month stays with private homes in Mexico that people are no longer bound to their office, to their schools. Everybody is working and studying remotely. And we have uh, done at least a half a dozen long stays for three months plus. That is exactly what you're saying. How do you view Douglas? I agree with you. And I really want that people keep traveling by bicycle because we are just starting that now. And it's happening so easy and we were trying to do this for in the last five years and now we're doing this like very fast and it's happening so clark just mentioned in one of the companies my last activity in us was a bike ride with him and jim lutz from via and when i came here we decided uh, to 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 do this uh to i mean to restart we used to have a brand for biking trips in brazil that were just like sleeping and now it's alive. We are having full trips every uh, every departure that we are launching. So uh, I hope the people keep traveling by bicycle. I hope the pe pe people travel more for the nature, as you said. So I think that's what I don't want to change. Keep cycling. Fantastic. Uh, Jock Ogilvy has a, a question for you guys. And this is going to be our last one. And uh, do you have an a, a approximate time estimate as to when luxury travel we, we recommend. Look forward to hearing your ideas and how you are planning for the future. The question was uh, originally, just, but I, I believe you can answer this. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, so obviously if I knew this answer, I, I could uh, really monetize it, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, but I do have my uh, projections and my ideas just like we all do. I mean, we're already seeing in Mexico, it never stopped completely. Perhaps late March, April was incredibly dead, but it immediately came back with domestic market into May, June, and now July, September, mm -hmm. and, and the beginning of October, we are seeing a huge rebound in booking pace. People are still not traveling as much as they used to, but we've gone from a crawl to say 50% pace, which is very encouraging. Um, that said, there's very flexible booking policies and cancellation policies, so some will cancel, but we're at least seeing that this is lurching forward and these are international bookings. Um, I think we won't see real pre-COVID type uh, recovery until Q4 of 21 or Q1, 22. That, that's what we're basing all of our projections and our planning on, but I, I wish I really knew. Douglas? 
Um, we are expecting, I mean, we, the answer is really hard, of course, as Zach said, but our expectations is to have at least a 50% um, of the estimate um, income for 2021. So, and we are planning with these numbers. So if you have 50% of the income in 2021, we believe that 2022 will be 100%. But I will not be like surprised if we have a 2021, like 50, uh, 70, 80, or even 100%, considering now that we are opening more doors. So before we were doing only incoming, now we're doing cycling trips, outdoor training, and other small uh, business locals. So that's why uh, we, we, we will not be surprised with a better year. But, but of course, uh, the expectations must be low because it's better to prepare for the low and to celebrate the high. Just one one point to add to Douglas's, and I want to hear Roberto's idea as well. Uh, I think that we have to be careful. I, I actually congratulate you, and I think because you're launching new products and new services, you may, and I hope that you do hit those targets, and, and I'm not doubtful. But if we're still doing the same thing, or if we look at luxury travel, just pre and post, even the 100%, you know, even a full robust recovery will take place in the context of a really globally damaged economy. So I don't think that we will get to 100. I think 100 will be 70. I think we have to wait until the airlines travel again and the hotels are up and running. I mean, we have supply chain disruption. We have closures of a lot of attractions. Uh, so I think it's better to be conservative and be surprised, but uh, I think we're on the same page as far as the overall. I'm, I'm just uh, uh, maybe so optimistic because of the domestic market that is like the people who are dying to travel in Brazil and the people who are booking things in, uh, inside the country. The flights have recovered already 40% of the total um, uh, like the schedules. Uh, from before the crisis. So that's why I think it could be better. But internationally, for sure, I'm not expecting something like that for 2021. Yeah, yeah most, of, most of the things I was going to say, Zach and, and Douglas already said, great, great answers. Uh, I think the, the high-end market, is uh, specifically the, the remote market that we most of us work on, uh, it has this great advantage of being like, remote in small properties or small uh, working with very FITs or small groups. So it tends to, to, to be back sooner than the regular tourism and other like resorts and big boats and, and, other, and other things. And especially the, 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 the flights, uh, I'm not sure, and this is more empirical, but I think the flights uh, became and are becoming much more expensive, at least for a period when 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 the, the demand is going to be uh, different and the offer is going to be different. So, in my opinion, the price is going to be it's going to be higher, and the the high end market, I think it's it, it, it's less painful than the, the the conventional tourism. So that's the only point I would I would add. Thank you, guys. Uh, Douglas, Zach, and Roberto, we are running out of time to finish our uh, show. Uh, so could you just, uh, let's just make a, a, a round with a final message to our audience, please. Uh, Want to start, Douglas? Yes. Uh, well, just thanks remote to make it happen. Uh, of course, it would be much better to be everybody in Argentina to celebrate together. Uh, but we need to do what, what is possible. And I think you did a great job. And thanks again for the invitation to be here and to be possible to share some of our learnings uh, and a final message that we should uh, learn more with people who lives in the outskirts of the city and places without any, without any uh, structure, because these people know what is resilience for sure. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Douglas. Zach, final message. Sure. Again, great thanks and gratitude for you guys putting this on and for staying positive and for staying focused on the mission. Uh, I think as well that we need to stay optimistic. We need to stay healthy. We need to stay strong. 
uh, also compassionate and be patient and understanding of everyone around you, your team, your family, your friends, your colleagues, the, the industry at large. And my last message would be uh, the best way to stay positive and to stay focused is to get remote and to go to nature. And I think that's where I found the greatest uh, energy source and positivity is in the ocean, the mountains, the rivers. And so go to nature. Thank you so much, Zach. Roberto. Okay, uh, I just want to remember a, a, a short part of a, of a talk we had on remote 2018 in Costa Rica from Hans Fister from Cayuga Collection, and he was uh, in, uh, he was in charge of, of telling us some trends for the tourism industry for our uh, specific industry, and one of the friends or one of the suggestions he, he gave everyone was be prepared for a cause. It, it must, it, it, sometimes it happens and every 10 or 20 years it's going to happen. So, so be prepared. And here we are. Uh, it was very interesting to, to remember that. And now we are Everybody, everybody's working on plan A, B, C. I think we are not more vulnerable than we were, but I think we realized we are, we are we realized much more how vulnerable we are. So I think it's interesting to remember that. And it, it, as a very final message, I just want to say how how happy I am to 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 be in this co leadership with. Uh, Clara, Ligia, Daniel, and Marcelo, and, and some other people on, on our team. And how good is to be a leader on a horizontal way and not being a leader of other people and ju just being another leader in the structure. And I think this is the future. I think collaboration and especially cooperation is going to be uh, it's going to be the key for, for the success in our industry in the future. So I'm very, very happy to be part of the, such a great team and such great people like you guys and all the, the great community we are building together, uh, everyone here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much. I totally agree with you, Roberto. We are part of a great team and part of a great community. Thank you so much, Douglas. Thank you, Zach. And we appreciate the effort of every speaker to be here and share their ideas. Thanks to the audience. Uh, in special thanks to Patricia Pego, our assistant in the backstage, and to our production team at Pirula Films, uh, especially to Luffy Fisher and Marcelo Pizaya. I hope your, uh, our panel and our presentations were inspiring to everyone. And now I, I want to invite my colleague Ligia to bring our final message of the day. Wow, two hours and a half, like, rush. <laughs> I don't know for you, but I feel like that. Uh, and for those of you who have your meeting scheduled for tomorrow on, you will find all the information you need on the intranet right after these last words. Don't forget, we will meet you on Zoom for our first get together. And work tourism may be recovering slowly, but we are getting prepared for its comeback with an advantage. Isolated, remote, outdoor destinations have been reinforced as a global trend, as the guys just said. And we've always been doing, we've all, uh, we've all been doing this for a long time. It's basically on our DNA. And no one on the planet is more certain and passionate to promote tourism in remote destinations than the hotel community, DMCs, and travel designers partner of the remote Latin America. I believe we all agree we are a high touch industry. I would actually emphasize the high human touch industry which was forced, just like anyone else, to into the digital routine. Despite the challenges, I now see so much power and openness to create stronger bonds year-round, and it is our promise to be the glue for this amazing group of people. Thank you for the dozens of individuals who have invested their time to be inspired today. You are a fundamental part of the remote Latin America community. We hope to see you all very soon in person. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.